Hey, buddy, watch this. Hello, hello, Regis is the name, and Hearthstone is the game, and this is my crafting guide for the Coal Bolds and Catacombs expansion. Now, what that means is, in this video, I'll be walking you through all of the cards I think you should be crafting from the Coal Bolds and Catacombs expansion. This is not covering every card in standard format, just the cards from this single set. I'm also not going through every single card in the expansion. I'm merely talking through the cards I think you should craft. And when I'm doing that, I'm going to be using a system where I'm separating them into three different groups. So let's go ahead and talk about what each of these groups mean to me. Up first are the very, very best cards. These are the stars of the expansion. The cards that absolutely everyone needs to own are played in a ton of different decks and have virtually zero risk because they're just so fundamentally good and seem to fit any given Hearthstone meta or era. These cards are going to be centerpieces for your collection. On top of that, we also have some strong cards. Now, these are cards which may not be quite as good as the star cards, but are still widely used in the meta. They're very influential, and there's very little risk that these are actually ever going to fall out of play. So these are cards that are good in their own right. Now, maybe they aren't played in quite as many decks as star cards. Maybe they're limited to a single class or a single archetype, but they still are so influential that you can't go wrong crafting them. And then finally, we have the solid cards. Now, these cards... Uh, they're still good. They're still, you might notice some very powerful cards that are in meta defining decks right now. But these are cards that I've identified as they have a little bit of risk. In other words, essentially these cards um, might only be good in one specific deck. And even though that's a tier one deck right now, perhaps that won't always stay a tier one deck. Or these are cards that are single handedly attached to some other combo or game plan or something that limits their potential in the future. So even though you craft them right now and they might be incredibly strong at the moment, that doesn't necessarily mean they're always going to be that strong or that good for your collection. And when I make crafting recommendations, I wanna make sure that you're adding value to your collection over the long term. Because essentially, there are two kinds of crafters out there in the world, right? There are people who are trying to build a good general use Hearthstone collection, and there are people who are trying to build a singular deck. Now this video is not for people who are going to build a single deck list. If you have a deck list you want to play, you should craft exactly those cards. If you're somebody who's looking to build a good, solid, well-rounded Hearthstone collection, this is going to be the video for you. So let's go ahead and jump into the legendary cards that I'm going to recommend crafting for Kobolds and Catacombs. Now I have to say before I get started, there really aren't that many super awesome legendaries in the Kobolds and Catacombs set. Compared to previous expansions, this one's actually pretty lacking in regards to strong legendaries. So when it comes to star legendary cards in this set, in fact, there aren't any. Now, this is not something I expected, but I just can't in good conscience say there's some general use legendary that's going to be good for everybody's collection. Previous sets have had those. Things like Prince Keleseth and the Lich King, for instance, and Knights of the Frozen Throne were both incredibly strong, and they're just great additions to your collection because they're played across so many different decks. There's no legendaries in Kobolds and Catacombs that follow suit. The neutral legendaries in this set just aren't that good. They're not being played all that often. So moving into strong cards, there are a couple of those. Uh, up first, I think Skull of the Minari, the Warlock legendary weapon, is great because it's being played, of course, pretty predominantly in Q Block right now, one of the most popular decks in Hearthstone. So you can't go wrong with Skull of the Minari if you're ever planning to play Warlock. It's not a star card in my mind because it's only good for Warlock. Now, right now, it's only good in Q-Block, but this card does have some general utility since it can summon demons. It doesn't just have to be a cube, Carnivorous Cube synergy card. It could be in other decks in the future as well. So that's why this is essentially a Tier 2 craft for me instead of the Tier 3. Uh, on top of Skull of the Minari, we have another legendary weapon with Alaneth, the Mage legendary this time around. It is also another card that's pretty safe to craft if you're planning to play any sort of secret burn slash tempo mage deck. Alaneth is really popular in those lists and in fact a pretty powerful addition to those lists just ensuring that you can draw a ton of cards in the late game to find the remaining damage or just enormous amounts of cards you need to continue to pressure the board and just find lethal against your opponent. So it looks like that's always going to be relevant because Mage can always build pretty fast decks and Alaneth just has such a singular design and is so fitting for the class that uh, not every deck for Mage is clearly going to run Alaneth, but it seems like that style could stick around for a long time. So I think it's a fairly strong craft as well. 
Now moving on to just the solid cards here, or the Tier 3 crafting cards. Uh, there's only a couple more here, and that might be surprising that I'm only going to have four total legendaries on this list, but that's just how it works right now for Kobolds and Catacombs. Up first is the Paladin Legendary Weapon, Valineer. Now this is one we've seen uh, find some success in faster, more aggro-style Paladin decks, particularly earlier in the expansion. Right now it's actually losing a little bit of steam, and it's not even being played all that much. So this one's barely making the cut as it stands right now. But it is the kind of card that just looks fundamentally strong. It's good in its own right. Mid-range decks make sense with it. Certainly Agro Paladin could still find some uses for this in the future as well. So I still think Valineer is a solid card to craft. On top of that, a card in a very similar spot is Rin, the First Disciple for Warlocks. This is another one that was more popular at the beginning of the expansion. It's certainly losing a little bit of popularity along the way. But still being played in more control-oriented carnivorous cube or just demon control warlock decks right now. So still making the cut as that sort of late game value bomb card. Even if you don't get a Zari off, this can just generate a lot of resources and synergizes particularly well with things like Nazoth. So Ren the First Disciple still another pretty good card to craft in this expansion. Not going to be you know meta-defining. It's not going to totally reshape your collection or be the centerpiece for a deck. But it's a good card to have around because it looks like it might make sense in Warlock for a while to come. So now let's jump into some epic cards. When it comes to epics, we actually do have a star card in this set, and it certainly won't be any surprise. It is the Corridor Creeper. There's not much to say about this one. Corridor Creeper is right now being run in almost half of all Hearthstone decks, which is just completely absurd. The power level for this card is off the charts. It can instantly win games if you're able to play it for zero mana early enough. Everybody either has to run it for its aggressive nature or sometimes just to run it to counter other people running it for its aggressive nature. So Quarter Creeper, right now, you have to have this card to find a ton of success in Hearthstone. It is absolutely fundamental to your collection. Far and away the best card to craft in the entire set. And even if it gets nerfed, hey, it's still worth the craft because you get a full refund on your dust. So you just can't go wrong with Quarter Creeper. You have to have it. It's a must-craft 5-star, 10-star card. It is the absolute very, very best. Now, on top of that, there are some good strong cards uh, for epics in the set as well. Uh, up first, we have the Spiteful Summoner, and this one was very nearly a star card in my mind. Um, the only problem with Spiteful Summoner, right, is that if you want to play Spiteful Summoner, you have to do it in only a handful of classes right now. Does it work at all? And there's really only one deck with the sort of dragon uh, satellite priest, as it's called, big spell priest, you could also call it, with Grand Archivist and Spiteful Summoner. That's the only super high-tier deck right now that's running Spiteful Summoner, uh, and that's its real limitation. It is a neutral card, which is a good sign for a card's craftability, because theoretically you can use it across multiple uh, classes. But the problem with Spiteful Summoner is that it does require big spells to work, and only some classes have good big spells that are natural fits and don't otherwise limit your deck too much. So some limitations on Spiteful Summoner, although clearly a good card and a neutral card. Uh, on top of that, for other strong cards, we also have Void Lord in Warlock. Uh, pretty clearly, Void Lord has become very prominent in Cube Lock. Uh, it's a great carnivorous cube kind of target against defensive decks. It also works so well with Possessed Lackey. Uh, on top of that, it's also run in Control Warlock lists as well that don't run the cube combo but still want big, awesome Death Rattle minions that have so much defensive power and synergize with both Gul'dan and Nazoth. And then finally for my third card here in the strong set, we also have Call to Arms. Uh, a pretty much meta-defining card at this point uh, because of its prominence in Aggro Paladin. And Aggro Paladin is probably the best deck in Hearthstone right now as far as win rate's concerned and, and ladder efficiency is concerned. And Call to Arms just works so darn well in that deck, pulling knife jugglers and all the other shenanigans available for low-cost minions uh, to Paladin. So it, it's absolutely perfect for what that deck's trying to do. And frankly, it's even being used in, in slower, more control-oriented uh, Paladin decks as well, pulling out things like Dirty Rats, for instance, for solid bodies uh, for two-mana cards that still get uh, recruited into play via Call to Arms. So a, a bit of a wide range of uses for Call to Arms, and it looks like the kind of card that could be good for a long time to come in Paladin, both in an aggro set sense, but also sometimes in more mid-range or control variants as well, and that's why it's a strong card, and not just a solid card, even though it's just a class card, both it and Void Lord. Since they work in multiple archetypes right now, it seems like those are very safe crafts to me. Now, finally, moving on to uh, sort of our Tier 3 solid crafts here. Up first, we have the Carnivorous Cube. And you might be saying, well, wait, why is Void Lord a tier above Carnivorous Cube? And the reason for that is that Carnivorous Cube right now is really only being played in one very specific deck. 
And although it's incredibly strong in that deck and it's a high tier deck, there's some risk to that because if for whatever reason Q block doesn't work for the next year or two or for some reason the meta shifts around Q block and silence overtakes it, then Carnivorous Cube could very easily become a fairly useless card. So yes, right now it's incredibly playable and incredibly strong, but there's some risk inherent to that. So I'm I'm not able to put Carnivorous Cube on the same tier as Void Lord, which seems more good in and of itself and seems to work across multiple archetypes, not a single very narrowly defined deck. So Carnivorous Cube, only a solid tier three craft at this point. Uh, on top of that, we also have the Grand Archivist here in the third row. Uh, this is another one that's, you know, obviously comparable to Spiteful Summoner. They often get played together. And even though both Carnivorous Cube and Grand Archivist are uh, neutral cards, which typically rank higher in my uh, sense for for craftability, uh, this one has some limitations, much like Carnivorous Cube. Right now, it's really only in Dragon Priest, and it's it's even worse in other classes than Spiteful Summoner. Some some of those big spells you don't always want to cast. Um, and Grand Archivist pulls them out of your deck and casts them. Spiteful Summoner works because it just creates a minion at their cost, so there's less risk inherent to that. So Grand Archivist essentially similar to Spiteful Summoner, but just overall less utility and therefore less good of a craft. Uh, beyond that, we also have a couple class cards here in Tier 3. We have Branching Paths for Druid. Um, four mana card, it's being played in Druid a ton right now. Uh, the only downside to this is the Druid is not really a Tier 1 deck at the moment, or if it is, it's Aggro Druid and Branching Paths. doesn't work in Aggro Druid. It's clearly much, much better in a more defensively minded Druid. Yes, sometimes Branching Paths can give you damage thanks to that plus 1 attack, but it's not inherently an Aggro card. It's much more of a Flex card that fits in more mid-range or control style decks, and that's where we're seeing Branching Paths at the moment. It's just not being played all that much because Druid's not that high tier at the moment so branching paths is going to be good it's going to work in druid for a long time but just not good enough yet to, to bump it up and then finally we have psychic scream for priest here is the last of the uh, epic recommendations for crafting another instance just like branching paths fantastic card only good in certain kinds of decks though for priests it's clearly more control oriented decks but an incredibly good card that's going to be a staple in priest but since it's only a part of one class and it uh, doesn't work across multiple archetypes uh, tier three craft instead of its tier two, but still, if you ever play Priest, Psychic Scream is going to be something great to have in your collection. So all that said, let's now move on to rare cards. Now, when it comes to rare cards, uh, there's actually, again, a hole here for star cards. There just aren't any neutral rare cards in Kobolds and Catacombs that stand that far above their peers. And in fact, there's not going to be a single, I'll just spoil it right now, not a single rare neutral card is a crafted recommendation at all. Frankly, the neutral rares in Kobolds and Catacombs are just terrible. Only class rares are going to make the cut here. So in good conscience, I just can't recommend anything as like a must-have collection-defining rare card. There just aren't any. So that said, let's go ahead and move on to the strong cards, the tier 2 crafts here instead. And up first there, we have the Elven Minstrel for Rogue. Now this guy is showing up very uh, prominently in Tempo Rogue. He makes a lot of sense in Tempo Rogue, just refilling your hand of those Keliseth buff dudes and drawing into those Bone Mares and all those resources you need to close out games. Uh, in the mid-range, in the mid-game. It's fantastic for that. It's not necessarily always the best turn four play, but even then it can work too. It just keeps your hand full and keeps applying the pressure, which is really nice. But that's not the only place Elven Minstrel works. It's not just in a single deck. It seems like it's just going to be a staple for Rogue across different archetypes, and that's why it's a tier two instead of a tier three craft for me. Um, on top of that, we have the Warlock card, Lesser Amethyst Spellstone, of course, this one is showing up in Q-Block. Really, any more control-oriented Warlock deck, much like Void Lord before it. So for all the same reasons, Void Lord fits is an epic card. Lesser Amethyst Spellstone is fantastic as a rare card, too. Seems like any time control Warlock, or even really mid-range Warlocks, would exist in the meta, Lesser Amethyst Spellstone would fit right into those decks, and that's why it takes that spot right here. So let's go ahead and move on to the th solid cards, the Tier 3 cards. Up first... Uh, is Druid's Lesser Jasper Spellstone. This one's pretty quickly becoming a staple cheap removal card in Druid. It synergizes really well with a lot of different things Druid is trying to do in regards to armor gain, and they even got additional armor gain cards in Kobolds and Catacombs, so it's a very easy to empower it. And a cheap spell is fantastic for Druid because they've had trouble with single target removal in the past, so this gives them a little bit of extra reach there, and it seems like a going to be a fantastic card for Druid moving forward. Uh, beyond that, we have Mage's Explosive Runes. This one is pretty clearly set up Secret Tempo Mage as a very high-tier deck in Kobolds and Catacombs. Maybe not quite as popular today 
as it was very early in the expansion, but Explosive Runes works really well for any mage deck that's looking to do damage, and much like Alaneth, mage decks are often looking to do damage, so I think this one is going to be a staple for the class moving forward. Uh, up next is Duskbreaker. For Priest, I probably don't have to say too much about this. Duskbreaker is fantastic in Priest right now. Uh, any any Dragon Core sets up for Duskbreaker beautifully. In particular, it's great off of Nether Spite Historian to enable extra Duskbreakers and to give you some more predictability when you're able to play those Duskbreakers. It almost gives you... It seems like four draws into Duskbreaker for Dragon Priest, because Nether Spite Historians almost always seem to turn into Duskbreakers in my mind. So, uh, clearly a staple in any Dragon-based Priest deck. The only reason it's really a Tier 3 card instead of a Tier 2 card is because it does have to be slotted into Dragon Priest decks in specifically. And there's some risk there, because you don't always know that Dragon Priest is going to be around in the same strength that it is today, and Priest might have to shift in some different directions, and that could leave Duskbreaker behind. So um, a bit of a risky craft in some ways, although clearly pretty good right now. Uh, similarly to that, the next card, Possessed Lackey, another one that's very clearly fantastic right now in a Tier 1 deck, but again, has risk. Possessed Lackey might not always be good. It's probably going to be solid as long as Void Lord's around, so as long as they're both in standard format. Um, it makes sense. It's it's likely going to be great. I don't think it's that high risk. But just in case, if, if Q-Block shifts or if the meta goes into a silence heavy mode, Possess Lasky could lose a lot of momentum and fall behind. So not a tier 2 craft, even though it's part of a really strong deck. So I had to move this one down to the solid spot instead. And then finally, the Unidentified Maul for Paladin. Another one that's great in aggro Paladin. Uh, lacks a little bit of utility in more mid-range or control Paladin decks, though, because you're less likely to have minions on board to receive those buffs. So since this is really a single archetype card, even though it's very good and meta-defining at the moment, still just a tier 3 craft in my mind, although obviously it's going to be a great addition to your collection, as is every single card that I've covered so far. So now this would be the spot where I go on to common cards, but frankly guys, common cards are so cheap, and everybody has so many common cards anyway, because you get common cards very easily in packs. I'm not going to make recommendations for crafting common cards. Uh, in a lot of cases, it's just common sense. If you need a card and you want to play a deck that needs a common card, you should just craft that card. It's not like you're wasting a lot of dusk or putting a lot of your time or investment at risk with common cards. Just craft the ones that you need to play a list. It's not going to hurt your collection. You need those fundamental pieces anyway, so just craft the common cards. It's not worth our time to talk about them in detail. It's just a little bit of dust here and there. So all that said, those are my recommendations for cards you need to craft from Kobolds and Catacombs. If you're missing any of these, they're all going to be great additions to your collection. They're going to allow you to build some strong decks. They're core pieces that look like they're going to be good moving forward. Now, I only discussed a handful of cards really here. I think it was something like 20 total cards I mentioned. So there are obviously a lot of cards I didn't talk about. Now, what does that mean? Well, first off, it doesn't mean that any card not mentioned on this list is a bad card. There are playable cards being played right now that I didn't talk about. But there's some problems. You can't always just recommend crafting a card just because it shows up in a deck here or there. If they're not, like, really important to the success of a high-tier deck, or if it looks like there's something that's going to suck soon because of the standard format rotation, I can't recommend crafting those cards. It's just not smart for people trying to build a general use collection to have those cards. So these cards on this list of me are the safe ones. These are the, the cards you can't go wrong crafting. They're going to serve some sort of purpose in your collection now and later. Put down your pitchforks. There's no hate going out. There's other good cards not on this list. These are just, to me, the cards that stand out the most. These are the cards that most people who play Hearthstone should probably have in their set. On top of that, a lot of people ask me which cards can I safely disenchant. And that's just not a discussion I'm willing to get into, guys. When it comes to disenchanting cards, there's so much risk involved. Anything can become a good card in the future. Like right now, yes, cards like the Rune Spear and King Togwaggle, they look like cards you can safely disenchant. But even those, you never know. Something could completely change and those cards could be playable. So I'm just not going to be willing to make recommendations for cards that you can safely dust. Because I really don't know the future. It's too hard to say. So I don't want people to burn a card that they end up needing in the future and blaming it on me. So you're just going to have to use your own discretion, your own judgment. Think about what you might want. Think about how long you need cards, how soon you need the dust, how urgent it is that you're competitive. Weigh all that and make your disenchanting decision. 
All that said, I hope this list has been helpful for people who are still looking to fill in some of those holes in their collections in Kobolds and Catacombs moving forward. If you have any thoughts, questions, comments, or recommendations, of course, leave those in the comments below. But until then, thank you so much for watching, and until next time, game on.